Thank you for joining us in this edition of The Internet, where we'll be discussing the virtues of the American justice system. My name is Chantal Lovell, and I'm the Director of Policy Strategy at the State Policy Network. Today I'm joined by the Honorable Clint Bullock, a member of the Arizona Supreme Court. Before his time on the bench, Justice Bullock served as the Vice President for Litigation at the Goldwater Institute, President of the Alliance for School Choice, and co-founder of the Institute for Justice, to mention only a few of his many accomplishments. Thank you for being with us today, Justice Bullock. Oh, it's great to be with you and with interns from all around the country. Well, let's jump right in. You've authored what I would say is a bookshelf full of books <laughs> and shorter works. Uh, one of them that stood out to me was, the, was Grassroots Tyranny, which, though published almost 30 years ago, seems to have a lot of relevance to uh, what we're dealing with in 2020. Tell us a little bit about that book and the concepts within it. Well, you know, most of us are focused on the national government and uh, appropriately so. So many, so many issues are resolved there. But uh, as far as our rights are concerned, often the greatest threat to our liberties is not uh, the government in Washington, D.C., but the Leviathan at home. And when you think about it, most of the government decisions that affect the most intimate uh, aspects of our lives, from education uh, to our, our job regulation to health and safety, they occur primarily at the local level. And so Grassroots Tyranny uh, was a book about the uh, issues that are often raised. Of course, we're seeing so many of those today. Um, and some of the constitutional doctrines that are intended to protect people's rights. When you wrote that book, were you envisioning the, the world of the, the sharing economy where people would be working out of their own homes or their own cars and, and having their local municipalities trying to put caps on that? Well, you know, not entirely, but many of the issues uh, raised in that book really uh, presaged issues that we're having today. For example, people were, were being arrested for operating businesses in, in their homes. Uh, I represented two elderly ladies uh, who crocheted pillows and that sort of thing. And the police were after them for uh, uh, basically doing things that they would sell at, at the local county fair. Now today, uh, the notion that the government would come and say, no, sorry, you can't work at home. They're telling you, you have to work at home. So it's uh, remarkable how, how things do change. Uh, but the, the, the key concept is that constitutional rights uh, are, are protected against every level of government. And fortunately, we, we have not only federal, but state constitutional protections against uh, abuses of, of freedom by our local governments. Now, you alluded to the fact that many of us are working from home these days. We're recording this uh, interview on the heels of the coronavirus pandemic, where we've seen government officials at nearly every level, if not every level, invoke emergency powers. Uh, you recently authored a piece that was published by the Hoover Institution about emergency powers in times of crisis. Tell us more about that. So certainly government's powers grow during an emergency. Uh, there are so many emergency authorizations that, for example, Congress has given the president, legislatures have given the governor, and uh, municipalities as well. We've really only recently discovered just how many of those authorizations there are. But the real question comes, does government's constitutional authority grow during an emergency? And thankfully in our constitutional republic, the answer to that question is emphatically no. And I looked at two Supreme Court cases uh, from the last century that really illustrate that point. One was the infamous Korematsu decision in which Japanese internment camps were actually upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. And of course, that's one of the most reviled decisions in all of American jurisprudence. And the court there held, 
yes, uh, the president is commander in chief. And if he determines that there's an emergency, of course, uh, he can take people's property and uh, put them into what really was internment camps. But very shortly thereafter, President Truman attempted to shut down steel companies, actually uh, shut, the, shut them down in order to keep them operating under, um, uh, under emergency orders. Um, and that was in the context of strikes that were going on. And uh, he was concerned that there wouldn't be enough steel for the war that was going on in the 1950s in Korea. And the US Supreme Court thought better of it and said, you know what? No, these uh, people have rights, individual rights, and they are not suspended or uh, re restricted in times of emergency. And that has been the rule, thankfully, ever since. Yeah, as you were talking about this and describing a case where the Supreme Court ruled in a surprisingly poor way and, and then in a good way, it made me think back to the Kelo decision. Uh, so talk a little bit about your involvement in that and, and how a case for the Supreme or decision by the Supreme Court um, though maybe initially not what uh, lovers of freedom would like, can ultimately do good. Well, interestingly, this issue involves uh, eminent domain, which is the power of government to take private property for public use. And one of our earliest cases at the Institute for Justice challenged a casino owner who wanted to build a parking lot for his limousines and the people uh, wouldn't sell that property to him, so he used eminent domain to take it. That person became president of the United States. His name is Donald Trump. Um, but we took many of these cases, and, and by the way, we won that one. Uh, so he was not able to, to use uh, eminent domain to accomplish that purpose. But the big case that went to the US Supreme Court was Kelo versus City of New London, Connecticut, where uh, a Pfizer plant wanted to expand and the government took, uh, literally demolished a working class neighborhood. Um, and then Pfizer ended up changing its mind and, and the land to this very day is still desolate. The homes are gone. And the US Supreme Court, by a five to four decision, ruled that this was permissible, that even though the Constitution says you need a public use, well, public benefit really is all you, all you need. And the court literally rewrote the Constitution. And uh, fortunately, that was not the end of the story. The Institute for Justice went from state to state uh, states like Michigan and Arizona and others, and secured greater protection for private property rights under their state constitutions. They went also from uh, uh, to legislatures around the country to uh, secure greater protection for private property rights. And it's quite possible that uh, th with the current composition of the US Supreme Court, that the Kelo issue would come out a different way if it were decided today. It's a great story. Uh, for those of our viewers who haven't yet seen it, uh, Little Pink House is a great movie about the Kelo decision. I made all of my friends watch it, especially <laughs> those who are not inclined to limited government thinking. Uh, but back to your judicial philosophy. I wanna bring up another book of yours, uh, David's Hammer, The Case for an Activist Judiciary. Would you consider yourself an activist judge? Well, I certainly consider myself an activist judge in the sense of enforcing the Constitution, uh, the, both the state and federal Constitution, and every provision in it. Um, I think that uh, a judge who fails to do that is a judge who's not living up to his or her uh, oath of office, which tells us to do exactly that. And uh, by activist judge, though, I do not mean a judge who legislates or a judge who exercises executive powers. That to me is a lawless judge because the judge has taken on powers that belong not to the judiciary, but to the legislative or the executive branches. It's funny, though, in writing that book, which was published by the Cato Institute, they begged me not to use the term the case for an activist judiciary because it would destroy 
any chance I would ever have of being a judge. And I said, ah, I'm never going to be a judge anyway. Well, I, I'm glad it didn't destroy your chances. Uh, I heard you describe yourself uh, as a textualist. What does that mean? And how so a textualist, and this is the school of thought that Antonin Scalia, Clarence Thomas, and, uh, uh, and others like Neil Gorsuch subscribe to, and, and some liberals as well. Um, basically, it's the school of thought that says that the judge's job is to interpret the text of the Constitution as it was written, uh, using the words as they uh, were meant uh, at the time they were written, and applying them to the realities of today. So, for example, freedom of, of the press, well, at the time of the founding, that literally meant a printing press. Today, it's certainly not a stretch to say that it, it encompasses the internet. Uh, but you wouldn't, for example, to go back to the Kilo example, you would never say that uh, public use means public benefit. That is literally amending the Constitution. The framers of the Constitution gave us methods to amend the Constitution. Judicial fiat was not one of them. Before we wrap up, I want to ask a question about free speech because many of uh, the people in our audience are college students and I would argue some of those most directly impacted by the war on free speech and cancel culture. What advice would you have for those who want to protect free speech in their daily lives? Well, first of all, just like all of our liberties, the freedom of speech is universal and reciprocal. If anyone's freedom of speech is violated, then all of our freedom of speech is violated. And that means that if you see speech that someone else uh, says that you disagree with, stand up for their freedom of speech. Um, for example, I opposed uh, a constitutional ban on flag desecration uh, back in the 1990s. It came within a, a vote of winning in the United States Senate. I don't like to see people burn the flag. Uh, certainly not. I would probably try to rescue a burning flag. But uh, is it free speech? In my view, it, it emphatically is. It, it conveys a, a very powerful message. So first and foremost, recognize that it's a universal right and stand up for your opponent's freedom, just like you'll stand up for your own. But uh, don't back down. Uh, you know, one area in which the courts have done an extraordinarily good job, and this is true of the US Supreme Court, liberals and conservatives still strongly stand for freedom of speech. And I think if, if you end up having to go to court um, the courts are, are going to be very, very good about protecting your rights if, if that's necessary. Thank you so much. That's all we have time for today. Justice Bolick and our viewers, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you tune in to our other installments of the internet.